joining me now is acclaimed critic, author, editor, and Lovecraft, uh, what would you say, researcher, S.T. Joshi? That sounds good to me. Now, I, I have to say, what, what brought you to my attention recently, um, first off, thank you so much for your time. I know it is very valuable, and you have, what, 30 different projects um, either in development or soon to be released? Uh, actually, I have finished 36 books that are just waiting with publishers to be published, and but I'm always working on a multitude of other projects, uh, you know, day in and day out. Right, and one that particularly catches my eye is one 21st Century Horror, which is a collection of... Um, I don't know, ruminations on different authors in the fic field of weird fiction. Uh, and, and this is actually a follow-up to a previous volume, right? Correct. Um, I spent five years writing what I believe to be a comprehensive history of weird fiction, beginning with the Epic of Gilgamesh in 1700 BC and going up to the present day. Uh, and that was a two-volume work called Unutterable Horror. But as I got toward the end of that uh, volume, I realized that I simply didn't have the time or, or maybe even the energy uh, to cover the contemporary writers among us. I mean, there are so many of them. Uh, uh, and, you know, it would have taken an additional year or two to, to do that. And I felt, well, I've already spent five years on this project. Let's just get this out right now. And then I'll consider doing some of these uh, more contemporary writers later. And now that's what I am uh, engaged in doing because there are plenty of good writers out there, plenty of not so good writers out there, and I believe that it's one of the functions of criticism to to distinguish the good from the bad, to to help readers along in terms of what they should should read. Now, as you say, as you say on your blog, uh, in, in speaking about twenty first century horror, um, some authors are are progressing with their craft, and some have kind of slid back into uh, bad habits from early in their careers. And what brought you to my attention recently is is that uh, apparently there seems to be a schism between you and one Brian Keene, who makes the comparison on his uh, seldom updated blog, that uh, he makes the comparison of you to uh, Saruman from Lord of the Rings. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's playful, and he, he's also... But he's also complimentary of your contributions to uh, the field, such as biographies of, I believe uh, he mentioned Arthur Mackin, um, Lovecraft, uh, maybe M.R. James, right? Well, I mean, my focus has been on Lovecraft, uh, but I then, in the course of exploring Lovecraft, I, I covered some of his own predecessors, people like uh, Mack and Dunsany, especially Lord Dunsany, um, uh, M.R. James to some small degree. I, I edited a couple of volumes for Penguin of his stories, um, uh, a number of other writers. Uh, but I take it that Mr. Keene believes that I'm kind of a, a, an old fogey uh, who is not up to date on, on contemporary horror and does not have any sympathy with contemporary horror, that I'm stuck in the past and, and, and judge everything that is being written now based on the criteria of the past. Well, uh, no offense, but I think that's rubbish. Uh, I wrote a book called The Modern Weird Tale in which I covered a lot of contemporary writers, at least of that of that era. We're talking about the late 20th century, people like Stephen King and uh, Clive Barker and Ramsey Campbell, especially Ramsey Campbell, a uh, long chapter on him, uh, Robert Aikman, uh, Dennis Etchison, uh, Thomas Ligotti. Uh, I like to think that I am fairly comfortable with the leading lights of contemporary weird fiction, and so I have the uh, the uh, wherewithal to study some of these contemporary writers uh, as I am doing. Excellent. Now, I, 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 I'm I'm failing to understand where this came from. Does it does it really all stem from uh, social media whisperers? Uh, carrying messages back between the two of you? Uh, what what prompted this uh, disagreement? What exactly started this, do you believe? Well, okay. 
So I am writing a book on 21st century horror. Uh, and I'm still working on the authors whom I want to cover in this book. Because there, as I say, there's, there are plenty of writers I could cover. Uh, it all depends on the, the uh, you know, importance or magnitude of their achievement. I was led to cover Brian Keene because, hey, I mean, this guy is out there. He's published 40 or 50 books, and he, I believe he won a Grand Master Award or something like that from the World Horror Convention. I figure that that was some sort of uh, uh, token of, of some kind of importance. So I said, all right, I feel obliged to look into this Brian Keene fellow, even though I had heard genuine you know, reports that he was not exactly the uh, uh, God's gift to writing. But... Uh, <clears throat> So I started reading some of his books. Now, of course, I can't read all 40 or 50 books. That would take a lifetime. But uh, uh, I read four books and found them not only poor pieces of work, but but staggeringly poor pieces of work. I mean, I mean, this is like the worst schlock horror that came out in the you know in the 80s in the wake of, of best-selling writers like Stephen King. There were a whole flood of writers uh, and hacks and and wannabes who tried to imitate. Uh, you know, the best-selling horror style of people like Stephen King or Clive Barker. Uh, but they were just, you know, trying to ride the coattails uh, of those writers and, and trying to catch the wave of, of popularity of weird fiction. And Keene seems to think that there's uh, still a market for that kind of thing. And maybe there is. I mean, I suppose people buy his books, but uh, I, I found them appallingly badly written. I mean, to the point of making horrendous grammatical mistakes that you would think his publishers would have caught, but apparently uh, I have heard that his publishers do not do copy editing. So, uh, you know, <laughs> what, you, what you get is what, what Mr. Keene has written on his computer, apparently. So, uh, you know, there's no filter between him and the public, and so all these embarrassing grammatical errors come out. I mean, that, and that's, that's the least of his problems, of course, but, uh, um, you know, it, I, I was... I was flabbergasted. I, I just couldn't believe that this stuff actually got into print. And so I, I wrote an article that was frankly satirical. It was meant to be satirical because I have occasionally cultivated this tone in some of my uh, previous articles and reviews. I, uh, I I wrote recently that certain works and authors are so far beneath contempt that satire is the only recourse. Uh, all you can do is make fun of them. Okay, so you, you, you have pointed out uh, several uh, problems with his language and sentence structure, um, and, and maybe he confused the possessive your for the other your, right? Simple mistakes that an author of his stature should not make, correct? Uh, correct, and on top of that, it would appear that Mr. Keene has in the past uh, loudly claimed that Professional authors shouldn't make this kind of mistake, or these kinds of mistakes. Uh, and yet, when somebody pointed this out to him, pointed out these previous statements of his, uh, Mr. Keene uh, not only failed to answer, but basically blocked that person from his various uh, uh, Facebook pages or tw Twitter feeds or whatever. Apparently, uh, Keene does not respond to criticism very well. Well, w what you speak of, this satire, um, these satirical um, criticisms... Of, of different uh, pieces. I mean, Lovecraft even uh, dallied in that. I mean, he, he he dipped his foot into that occasionally, right? To, to some degree, yes. Uh, although, I mean, he, he was not really vociferous on that point. Uh, but Lovecraft actually, I mean, he didn't write a lot of literary criticism as such anyway. I mean, he, when he was involved in the amateur journalism movement, he, he was a kind of a, uh, you know, professional critic, as it were. But, uh, uh, he actually tried to find good things to say about whatever crossed his desk, and that actually is how he developed such a close ties with all these people who, who came in touch with him. So Lovecraft actually was a pretty mild critic, all things considered. Um, my mentors in this rather odd uh, realm of satirical criticism were people like Ambrose Bierce and H.L. Mencken, uh, who, uh, shall we say, did not spare the rod when, when they, uh, they wanted to flay something. Okay. Um, how would you say Keen is faring in in terms of the uh, the weird fiction overall? I mean, you, is he one of these these authors that that is not worth his salt, or that he there's still room to improve? What? Uh, I I doubt that there's a possibility of improvement. 
went on Mr. Keene's part. I mean, he seems to be writing the same sort of thing over and over again and, and not getting any better. Uh, as I say, I have not read his co collected oeuvre, but <laughs> from what I have read, um, uh, I think he's stuck. Um, and frankly, I, I'm flabbergasted at how he could have gained the kind of celebrity that he did. I mean, I think uh, what happens in this field, especially lately, is that people schmooze a lot. Mm. They, 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 you know, toady up to uh, other people or you know, important people in the field, and then they, uh, people start liking them, and therefore they, the, the, their, this personal fondness for, for their friends uh, blinds them to the flaws in their writing. Uh, and this raises a broader question as to whether we can even have any sort of honest criticism in this field, because they're so. This field is so small. A lot of people know know everybody else. I mean, I know a lot of people and a lot of professional writers and amateur writers. Uh, and you know, sometimes I have trouble, uh, you know, saying something bad about somebody I like. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But you know, as a critic, you have to be honest, and I don't see a lot of that out there. What if I told you that there was a subgenre that I, the best way I could explain it to you would be a mutation of weird fiction and weird tales um, that that fancies itself a, a term bizarro. It calls itself bizarro, and there are many of the authors who consider him, who see him like a grandfather figure. Um, who will impart advice to them, and they will take it as gospel. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I can confirm if you read Deadite Press editions of Keen's books, um, that there is not a lot of editing, and, and it's all very last minute when they're published. Now, I, I've been in the room, and I've seen when a Deadite Press editor says, asks someone to look over something, another editor, and he simply says, "Don't worry about." Uh, grammar or anything just tell me how it sounds how it flows and everything don't don't worry if something's misspelled yeah i can imagine that happening i don't know much about the uh, bizarro genre but and what i've read of what little i've read of it i don't care for that's just a personal taste mm -hmm. um uh, maybe there are good bizarro writers out there i have no idea um but this kind of carelessness in in publishing is simply reprehensible uh, I mean, our language is suffering badly enough from, from uh, you know, things like Facebook and Twitter and email even, where practically anything goes nowadays in terms of style and grammar, and that's very bad. Um, the, the language is really in a state of horrible decline, and, and somebody has to maintain some standards. Uh, and, and admittedly, in our small press field, Copy editors do cost money. I mean, you know, I actually have done professional copy editing for some publishers, and I do a lot of free copy editing, believe it or not, for, for authors and, and uh, you know, individuals, uh, you know, to, to help them a little bit. Uh, but there's no excuse for this. Um, and it just contributes to the, to, to the decline of standards. And, you know, I, I'm getting to the point that I can't even read this stuff anymore. I have, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I can hardly read any stuff written after 1960 because it's it's so, uh, you know, uh, loose and, and, and slovenly. Well, interesting. Uh, I have to ask this as, as kind of a sidebar here because, and, and my language is probably pretty harsh to your ears, uh, someone as studied as you, but do you feel that the beat movement contributed in any part to the corruption of language, discourse, um, all these things that to where uh, our predecessors used to communicate beautifully and concisely, and now it's, it's very staccato, and there are leaps and jumps all over the place, and it, n when speaking in dialogue, the, the sentences are not always correctly spoken. Do you think the beat movement, movement has any blame uh, oh, oh, not really. Uh, the beat movement, you know, produced some great writers, uh, Kerouac, Ginsburg. I mean, no denying that these are, are important writers in the field. Uh, you know, uh, 
I don't know if you consider uh, William S. Burroughs a beat writer, but certainly he was pretty radical in his use of English, but, but he knew what he was doing. Uh, I think the corruption has come more recently than that. Um, and it's come through media in general, and I'm referring not just to current social media, going back to things like the promulgation of, of television and things like that. Um, <clears throat> one of my uh, guilty pleasures is uh, watching a lot of sports. I do like uh, various sports. But the sports casters over the years have become more and more illiterate and simply, I mean, they cannot speak English. Uh, a good many of them happen to be ex-sports players, which is why they can't speak good English, I'm sorry to say. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and it's a problem that compounds itself because, you know, when when bad usage gets thrown out there uh, in uh, the mass media, uh, people pick it up because people listen to mass media and if they hear it coming from somebody, you know, on television or the radio or whatever, they say, oh, I guess that must be right. And then, therefore, they start using it themselves. And so counteracting that tendency becomes very difficult. Um, and social media, where people use all kinds of, you know, shortened uh, words or abbreviations and things, that just compounds the problem because then people don't even know what good, what, what proper usage is anymore and don't care, apparently. Uh, I don't know that this stuff is even taught in schools anymore. I mean, do people learn grammar? Uh, I, I have no idea, but... Uh, uh, it's a it's a very sad state of affairs, I think. Right now, you make the comparison in your critique of Keen that um, there are often action movie plots that he's dealing with, right? Yes. I th would but you say that sometimes it's okay to have that in a story, though? Um, he's so he's not the literary heir of Lovecraft. Would you say that there's room for that in your genre or? To be sure, there are plenty of writers who do good action sequences, uh, and even the best of them. I mean, Ramsey Campbell actually has some very good action sequences, and he knows how to develop a work, whether it be a short story or a novel, in in the sense that 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 uh, so that the pacing of the work, uh, you know, lures the reader in, and and he usually ends with a spectacular climax. Um, Caitlin Kiernan, uh, who is another spectacular spectacular writer. I mean, she, I think, is is the best writer in our field of her generation, uh, and I intend to say so in, in 21st century horror, but uh, she has, you know, you know, a lot of her work is very moody and, and sort of atmospheric, but but by heaven, she can, she can uh, you know, uh, pack a lot of action in her work as well. Uh, you know, and I, I actually read a lot of detective fiction and, and mystery fiction as well, and, and certainly there's a lot of good action there. It's all a matter of how it's done. Um, it has to be plausible, and it has to be an integral growth uh, uh, of the, the plot. Uh, what a lot of writers like Keane doing, and he's certainly not alone in this, he is writing with the conscious intent of, of wanting his films, wanting his books to be made in film. <laughs> this is kind of like the Holy Grail for, for popular writers. I mean, if, if, if they can make have a, have a movie made of their film, wow, they're, they're in seventh heaven, you know. And, and so their works become kind of, uh, you know, uh, in effect screenplays, uh, uh, sort, of, sort of rudimentary screenplays uh, rather than novels. Um, and, you know, and, and the, the action sequences are all, you know, either taken from movies that they've seen before or are imitations of things they have seen before uh, with the hope that, that some, somebody out there will turn their book into a film. I don't disagree with that. Um, what would be your final summation of Brian King? Do you think he's better off writing screenplays? Hollywood's going to have a lot of openings soon. Uh, <laughs> yes, well, uh, anything but novels, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, he can write whatever he wants to write. Uh, uh, nobody's obliged to read it. I'm not going to read any more of his stuff. If people want to read it, that's their choice. Uh, but let me just say there's a lot of better stuff out there to read. Fair enough. Um, I'm actually, I actually consider myself a keen fan, particularly Earthworm Gods. Um, but, you know, uh, different generation, different uh, background. I, I think it's fair. You're coming from an academic standpoint, and he's a big boy. He can, he can take, he can handle criticism. Uh, it's not going to affect his, his legions of unquestioning, adoring followers. That is for sure. Um, Maybe. Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't deny that. 
Uh, I'm not entirely sure he has legions of followers. I, I don't know how well his books sell, but uh, and if he's a real real hotshot writer, I'm not sure why he's publishing with Dead Eye Press, but it was a kind of tiny little little micro press as far as I can tell. Um, but hey, you know he's free to do what he wants to, and uh, you know and maybe he's written better books than the ones I read, but uh, uh, I tend to doubt it. Fair enough. Let's talk about the Lovecraft World Fantasy award uh that that uh whole i don't know what you would call it um dust up a few years ago uh, was it 2015 uh yeah i think so i think so so we're uh, only but, two but years the, out before that excuse me the the you know the 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 the, the, the uh uh the movement to get rid of that statue had had emerged before that certainly who, who did it start with? Was it Ellen Datlow? No, no. So far as I can tell, it was this uh, guy named uh, Daniel, Ho Daniel Jose Older, who I think he lives in the New York area, um, uh, and is either black or Puerto Rican or something like that. But uh, he got so offended at Lovecraft's racism, uh, and Lovecraft was a racist, and nobody's denying that, that he said, oh, well, this, uh, this statue has to go. And, and first of all, he proposed replacing the statue with a statue of... Octavia Butler. Octavia Butler. Yeah. Now, Octavia Butler, a fine writer, I dare say. I actually haven't read much of her, but A, she's not a weird writer. She's not a horror writer. She's a science fiction writer, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, and it was quite obvious to me and to any sane person that uh, Mr. Older was proposing her merely because she was a black woman writer. Uh, he felt that in the interest of diversity, we should we should uh, you know scrap this old white guy Lovecraft and and replace it with a black woman. Well, that's so then if, if it was if it, kind of well, I'm sorry to interrupt. Man. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just have so, to get this in there. If 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 it's solely because she was a black woman, and and I agree that she's a great writer. What what I've read of her, uh, it could have been any black woman, and it wouldn't have mattered. But merit matters in the awarding of an award. Granted. And the thing is, okay, a lot of people don't understand the history of the World Fantasy Award or the World Fantasy Convention. It began in 1975 as a Lovecraft convention. That first convention held in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, you know, was basically focused around Lovecraft. It was, took place in Brown University, for God's sake, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much. And, uh, you know, it had people like Robert Block and, and uh, uh, Frank Belknap Long and Fritz Leiber and Willis Conover and all these other people who knew Lovecraft. And, 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 and that's why Gideon Wilson fashioned that bust, uh, you know, as a, as a caricature of Lovecraft. Um, now, of course, the field expanded beyond that or the, the convention expanded beyond that. But what that award was signaling is Lovecraft's importance to the realm of weird fiction. And people don't understand that even uh, anymore. Uh, and I'd just like to go briefly into that. A lot of people these days say, oh, well, uh, Lovecraft's influence is only on those people who write true mythos fiction, you know, uh, you know, a lot of these pastiches and things. That's nonsense. Lovecraft's influence is, is enormous uh, in the whole history of weird fiction. I mean, I mean, he came at a time in the 20s and 30s uh, when you know, leading writers were there, like Mackin and Dunsany and Algernon Blackwood and James, and he consolidated uh, the work of those writers, uh, and and you know, uh, went, decided the weird fiction had to go in a different direction. He realized that the standard motifs of weird fiction, like the ghost, the vampire, the werewolf, you know, uh, the haunted house, those were all played out. You couldn't take them seriously anymore. So we had to go in a different direction, and he went into that direction by cr creating this thing that he called the Tool of Mythos. Actually, he didn't call it that, but no matter. Uh, this pseudo mythology that came, that he uh, devised, uh, in which uh, you know vast monsters from outer space come to the earth, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. That was a really radical maneuver, and what that did was to align weird fiction more closely with science fiction and make it a more forward-looking genre rather than a backward-looking genre that only looked towards, you know, old mythological themes uh, uh, out of folklore like like the vampire and, and the witch. That was a tremendously radical maneuver, and that's where Lovecraft's importance really lies, and that's why you can trace Lovecraft's importance not only in the subsequent history of weird fiction, uh, whether it be writers like Ramsey Campbell or Ted Klein or Thomas Ligotti, 
Uh, but even in science fiction, uh, I mean, it is it is demonstrably uh, a demonstrable fact that Lovecraft clearly influenced people like Arthur C. Clarke and and Philip K. Dick and Fritz Leiber and any number of others. So his influence is enormous, and that's what the the award is meant to signify. And what what they ended up uh, replacing the bust with was actually uh, a, a very unesthetic gnarled tree uh, with a background of a moon and it's very unesthetic unesthetically pleasing to the eye now it, do you, why did they settle on that what what how is someone supposed to be proud of that i was not obviously involved in the uh, 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 you know uh, planning out of the replacement statue i guess that was done by the committee uh, by the way, it has also been pointed out that that new statue it, it bears a striking resemblance to the poster of the film The Karate Kid, uh, which is also an embarrassment. Um, <laughs> uh, I think they obviously were choosing something as innocuous as possible so that future people wouldn't come up and say, oh, well, th th this is horrible and we got to change this now. Uh, the pro th this, and this raises a broader issue of how we judge past writers or past figures, you know, uh, of history. Uh, the critical mistake that the world fantasy people made when changing the statue is to, to judge people, uh, just historical figures, based on our, own, on our own social and political criteria. By that standard, very few people from the past <laughs> would survive intact. Uh, and there's another problem with that whole idea is in that 100 years from now, we ourselves will be judged quite harshly, I dare say, in some of our own failings that we perhaps don't uh, see ourselves. Uh, so this kind of uh, attitude just creates mischief. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, is it is it the reason that they cited for the replacement that bothers you or the removal of HP's likeness itself that that perturbs you more or are they not or are they not mutually exclusive well yeah the, the whole process was flawed because first of all in the the last convention i attended was the 2014 convention I, i've forgotten where that it was now uh, uh, maybe columbus ohio i can't remember but anyway they actually did a sort of informal poll among the members there as do you want to retain the statute or do you not want to retain the statue do you not care whatever uh, and evidently, I, I, I heard that the retain the statue votes slightly outnumbered the uh, get rid of the statue votes. Okay, fine. So I thought the matter was kind of settled there. But evidently, the World Fantasy Committee uh, does not believe in democracy because uh, when the committee uh, uh, came together to discuss this project, or this, this issue, uh, it had already been decided by whoever, <laughs> I don't know who, uh, to replace the statue, and so apparently those those votes cast in favor of it uh, uh, meant nothing. Now, I, I cannot find any statement, uh, and I and I've looked of Gahan Wilson. Did did I pronounce that right? Gay and Wilson. Gay and Wilson uh, yeah. making any statement of any kind on how he felt about the removal of of this bust that he does that he first uh, made. Uh, for the award and later won in, in uh, and I believe, the early to mid-2000s. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any statement he has made either. I mean, he is, you know, elderly man. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe, you know, who knows? But uh, I did think, feel it was also a slap in the face to Wilson himself because it's, you know, whatever you may think of this statue, and I have to confess that I, I regard it as kind of a, a caricature, a genial caricature. To be sure, it was meant, you know, uh, meant as an homage, but meant also to uh, uh, as a bit of a bit of fun involved there. I mean, that's that's Wilson's uh, thing there. But, um, it, it, it developed, uh, I think, among certain people, the the uh, 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 nickname of Easter Island Lovecraft, you know. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it was it was, uh, you know. Uh, disreputable, uh, you know, to, to Wilson himself, uh, an insult to him to get rid of that statue. And the audacity of the authors in this community uh, that you were part of uh, to continue to embrace these characters and this these this uh, signature choices of style that Lovecraft chose. 
all because it falls under public domain and they grant him no quarter in in uh, uh, because of mo their modern enlightenment uh they don't they don't bother to empathize with the times that he was that that he lived in uh how how the world was still developing culture was still developing and just the audacity uh, uh to me I, i've always taken on issue with the audacity that they that they are able to make use of these characters like um yog sothoth azathoth um did, did i pronounce it wrong yeah sure certainly okay. but the the, the 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 issue here is actually even broader than that uh, I mean, there are a number of issues here, very complicated, but um, let's be honest, a lot of contemporary writers uh, would not even have an audience, you know, for their work if it were not for Lovecraft. And I'm not talking just about the people who write about Azathoth and Yogg-Sothoth and Glue. I'm talking about a, a much broader range of people who have emerged only because Lovecraft's popularity has caused weird fiction to, to flourish uh, in our time. Um, and so it is, seems like the worst kind of, uh, you know, uh, biting the hand that feeds you uh, to then, then, you know, uh, latch on to Lovecraft and, and kick him in the, uh, in the butt for his racism and yet still continue to profit, you know, from, from their own writings, which, which wouldn't have existed if it weren't for Lovecraft. There are a number of other issues here. First of all, let's be honest, Lovecraft was a racist. No question. Right. But... There are all kinds of qualifications here. As, as you say, the culture was very different there. A substantial majority of people in the world in the 1920s were racist. There's no question about that. I mean, and Lovecraft wasn't by any means the worst of them. Uh, I actually compiled an entire book called Documents of American Prejudice, uh, in which I just reprinted all these horrible, uh, uh, you know, racist writings by very prominent people, uh, you know, across the political spectrum, they make Lovecraft sound like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, believe me. And these were, were, were books published, you know, and articles in, in major magazines, major publishers. They were out there. They were best-selling books at the time. Uh, Lovecraft restricted his comments mostly to private correspondence. Uh, and I'll tell you what, uh, I mean, it's only because Lovecraft got so famous that all his correspondence is not being published. I mean, if any of us got to that point where we're so famous that all our correspondence got published someday, well, I think a lot of us would be pretty embarrassed at some of the stuff that we've, we've talked about, but, but no matter. <laughs> the point is that Lovecraft was a whole lot of other things aside from being a racist. I mean, actually, I think atheism is, is the central core of his, of his philosophical thought. That's a whole lot more important uh, to his outlook and to his fiction than, than racism was, but Apparently, nobody talks about his, his atheism um, and all these other things that he was. That's one thing. The other thing was that some of the very writers that these uh, contemporary people who slam Lovecraft like a whole lot were also racist. Like, <laughs> the prime example is Jack London. Great writer, no question about it. But he, had a, he was furiously anti-Asian. He wrote a book called The Yellow Peril. Uh, I mean... I mean, you can't get much worse than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this and this book was, was was out there, you know, distributed far more than anything Lovecraft ever wrote. Um, that said, London himself can't be judged purely as a racist, and I'm not advocating that that he not be read anymore, or that that people jump on him, or or that nobody read him. You know, it's like there's a certain lack of nuance here, a, a certain lack of historical understanding, a certain inability to grasp the totality of, of, a, of an individual rather than just focusing on one specific uh, aspect of their of their thought and so that has to be you know when that when it's when it when that when people do that it has to be political it has to be there has to be an agenda involved there uh, and that's what offends me the most now you, truly it must have been the correspondence that tipped people off can we really ever make an inference from fiction, not nonfiction, but fiction, that an author is racist. If 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 we take away all of his correspondence with Robert E. Howard and uh, Frank Belknap Long, August Derleth, I guess maybe. Um, Actually, doesn't. Yeah, oh, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, if that correspondence didn't exist, would we know Lovecraft was a racist? Well, I think we would. 
but it will be far less muted. I mean, the story, uh, the horror at Red Hook. I mean, it's hard to see that that story is anything but racist. I mean, it's it's pretty pretty clear there. Now he fell on hard in, times in New York, though, right? I mean, he he hard? was he was afraid of everything uh, and everybody in New York, was he not? I mean, that was the oh, end well, of his. Yeah, I mean, he had a real bad time in New York. It was, I mean, the problem with Lovecraft is that he had grown up in this, let's be honest, provincial little town of Providence, Rhode Island. It's a be beautiful city. I love it. But, uh, you know, great colonial architecture, you know, great ties to the past, the 18th century. But you go from there to this, you know, vast megalopolis, which I've also lived in, by the way, uh, for many years. I was I was in New York City. Uh and it's a is an enormous culture shock, and you know, and Lovecraft just basically freaked out, and it didn't help that he couldn't find a job, he didn't have much money, he, he actually got robbed at one point, you know, his, his place got broken into, and all his suits got stolen, you know, he had a really bad time. So this this story was just kind of a kind of a catharsis for him of just getting out all his all his misery in, in a, a, of being in New York. That said, I mean, he still wrote the story, it got published in Weird Tales, and you know, it's out there. And it's it's racist, but the great, great majority of his work, of his fiction, has very few racist elements in it. In fact, almost none. I mean, you really have to look for them. I mean, you know, uh, you, you have to hunt them down. Uh, things like at the Mountains of Madness or the Shadow Out of Time or the Whisper of Darkness. There's there's nothing racist there, uh, and they are great works of literature. And even the Shadow of Rinsmith, which may or may not be a racist story, probably is, is still a great work of literature. I mean. That's just the way it is. I mean, you know, you cannot deny that it is a great piece of writing. Right. Um, and the fact that he, he married a Jewish woman, people often overlook that. But in today's culture, they uh, if you say if, if someone is accused of, of being racist unfairly and they, they cite, I have these people in my life who I care about greatly, and they say, oh, well, that's just your token black friend or your token Jewish friend. And I think that's despicable, that 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 sort of witch hunting that goes on culturally today. Oh, to be sure. And, and again, this is, uh, reveals another lack of understanding of where Lovecraft is coming from. A lot of his views on race were very abstract. Uh, I mean, it was just a basically a result of childhood indoctrination, I, I'm certain of it, uh, because I think he's, he got these views when he was like, you know, a little boy, quite frankly, it's quite obvious that, that these views were in, you know, in, ingrained in him by his family from a very early age. But more than that, he developed the idea that uh, immigrants, Jewish or otherwise, sh you know, who came to the United States should assimilate and become American. Now, somehow we think that's a bad thing these days, but quite frankly, when I came to the United States as an immigrant from India in the 1960s, even then, that was the expectation. You shed your previous cultural heritage and you became an American. That was what, what you know, people were expected to do. Uh, and for Lovecraft, he felt that Sonia, his wife, you know, a Ukrainian Jew, uh, had lived in the United States long enough that she was indeed an assimilated uh, American. In fact, she does not seem to have exhibited any, you know, uh, Jewish, uh, religious, or, or even cultural traits, uh, so far as I can tell. Uh, I mean, I don't believe she was particularly religious, uh, um, from what little evidence there is. And so she was acceptable to him, as were other Jews like Samuel Loveman or Robert Block or whoever that he that he came in touch with. Because you know they had they had adopted uh, you know American or Western values and, and that's fine and that's you know again a lot of people uh, ex accepted those uh, that that criterion. Mm -hmm. Now I'm very interested to talk about some of your detractors and and by proxy they are also Lovecraft detractors. I mean you've spent a great deal of your career um, tracing this man's footsteps and. Rightfully so. He was a gifted uh, individual, and he gave a lot to the arts. And, and um, I think that they're, they're, they're unnecessarily crippling his legacy um, in, in, a very, in a very hateful way. Now, Ellen Datlow seems to be the chief offender to me, and you've been outspoken about her many times in the past. What, would you, what do you say to... 
Well, okay. Um, Ellen Datlow, my little recent dust up with her was over her role in this World Fantasy Award situation. She is on the World Fantasy Award Committee, and I, I know for a fact that she was a major uh, uh, determiner in getting rid of that statue. She denied it uh, and lied in the process, but that's no matter. Um, she then later, when I, when I, when I, you know, threw out this accusation to her, she then came back and said, oh, well, I have great admiration for Lovecraft. I, I, I've read Lovecraft for a long time. Well, quite frankly, your admiration doesn't show very well, uh, or at least your, your historical judgment doesn't show very well uh, uh, in, in your actions. But uh, she is by far not, not at all the, the greatest offender in this regard. Uh, Ellen Datlow, generally speaking, has... Um, uh, I mean, her her thing. She emerged out of out of the science fiction field, uh, and then sort of gravitated toward horror later on. Uh, and her her uh, you know the thing is that uh, she has compiled these uh, best of the year anthologies for for many many years. Uh, I actually haven't read many of them, but I get the impression that she has a certain type of of uh, work that she likes to include. And I I, I like to call it the <coughs> Iowa Writers Workshop kind of writing, a kind of highbrow literary. Thing which she doesn't feel that Lovecraft embodies, uh, uh, because she thinks Lovecraft, you know, is kind of over the top and, and is a bad writer or a bad stylist. Uh, I think nothing could be further from the truth, but that, that's a whole separate matter. Uh, and so, as a result, uh, she tends to not like uh, Lovecraft, you know, writing or, or even anything that that has uh, you know elements of Lovecraft. Even though then she goes out and compiles anthologies, uh, you know, uh, of Lovecraft writing herself. So I'm not sure where that comes from, but. Um, she is, believe me, not not the worst offender in this regard. Who would you say is? Oh, I don't know if I want to mm. really name names, but uh, uh, what, see, what, this whole thing developed as a result of this whole uh, uh, Daniel Jose Older uh, uh, kerfuffle. Once he uh, started his campaign against the award, other people jumped on the bandwagon, apparently in part to prove their, uh, you know, uh, bona fides as true liberals, and I say that as a liberal myself, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I haven't voted for a Republican since 1982, so, uh, I mean, I, I am un unimpeachably liberal in my in my political views, but uh, these people feel they had to uh, uh, say, okay, I am, I am opposed to racism, and therefore I will uh, kick Lovecraft and, and uh, you know, and... Uh, do whatever to uh, tarnish his legacy because he was a bad person. Uh, well, okay. Uh, if you think that, fine. Um, what gets me is that uh, these people are also uh, riled up about racism, that they don't do anything about racism in our own time. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we, are, we are living in an age of, 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 of renewed racism right now, and they don't seem to be doing anything about it uh, because that's hard. Uh, it's much easier to kick some dead man who's, you know, can't, can't answer back uh, but, uh, you know, so that's all they do. Uh, Ross Lockhart, would you say that his uh, press word hoard has been successful uh, with its, its um, beginning, beginning anthology, The Children of Old Leech? Uh, I haven't read that book uh, and don't have much inclination to do so, but... Uh, uh, the book is a tribute to Laird Barron, who actually was once a fine writer, but I think has declined a bit. Um, uh, I think he tends to be writing the same thing over and over again, and uh, uh, that's unfortunate. I think he's you know sort of resting on his laurels, as it were. I think he needs to get back to the kind of stuff he wrote early on in his career, which was outstanding, I thought. But uh, let's uh, talk about Laird because, yeah. I, I, I was blown away by the Imago sequence and and also occultation and I get to Swift to Chase, I believe was the name of it. Yes. And the stories kind of leave me in this murky middle of the road limbo um, where I'm not sure what to make of the stories. I think the one story I appreciated was one that he had spoiled to me in an interview uh, years previous about the cyborg dog for lack of a better yeah wolf. i remember i actually enjoyed I, 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 that one i didn't think that was one of the better stories in the book i think there is there are some good stories in there but what i think what laird has started to do is write basically the same story over and over again he has developed a certain kind of 
you know, stylistic mannerism that has become a shtick. Uh, and it, every story sounds the same, and that's that's very bad. Uh, I maintain that he basically started believing his own press. For some reason, Laird Barron became the center of this kind of kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, clique of of people who surrounded him and praised him to the skies. Uh, and now he apparently believed that he was the great writer and therefore, you know, can just write whatever he wants to and, uh, you know, everybody will lap it up. Well, I think you have to work a little harder than that. Uh, and he's apparently on the verge of publishing a novel, and I hope the novel is good. I mean, I, uh, I mean, he, he has the rudiments to be not only just a good but a great writer, but um, I just hope he can reverse this, this, this tendency he's fallen into. I think the the story that did it for me with Baron uh, early on at least was Procession of the Black Sloth. I mean his mastery of um, dialogue, description, I mean it just it, it was all there in 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 that first collection. And uh, I I also think that maybe he has listened to his cheerleaders too much, but I think that uh, he has a, a rich legacy ahead of him. It's it's not that it's not wh how well they mimic Lovecraft. It's it, it should be about how how they advance their own uh, footing in in this genre, right? Oh, granted, uh, uh, Laird Byron is by no means any sort of imitator. I mean, he I I actually think that the best story he has written, <laughs> and I hope I can say this without immodesty. Is the one that I commissioned him to write. That is uh, the broadsword, uh, which was published in the first Black Wings anthology. That's in occultation. I still think that's maybe the best thing he's ever written. Uh, and I was, I was blown away by that story and just was tickled pink to get it from him. Um, no, but but and and that you know even that story was was written for a Lovecraftian anthology is by no means any kind of you know uh, straightforward pastiche. It it uses Lovecraft as a springboard for expression of Laird's own ideas and and and, and understanding of the world, and that's exactly what a writer should do, um, you know. And so so he, he certainly has the the ability to to get back on track. I just hope that he he you know he, he does that. You you just you reviewed uh, on your blog uh, a story that you were you were very um, hesitant to even talk too much about I believe but it described and I haven't read this collection I don't remember the name of the collection but it made me want to read it even though uh, you were fairly damning of it and I think the title of the story in the anthology was. Uh, don't make me assume my human form, and it involved these two warring mannequins or ventriloquist dummies. May, I can understand why he wouldn't include that in in one of his own collections. It was probably commissioned by a Bizarro um, editor, if I'm guessing, um, or somebody. With Actually, this... I think that appeared in the Ross Lockhart anthology, Clue Fatagen. I, okay. I think so, but I can't remember now. Actually, I, I have to confess. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty bad story. Uh, <laughs> it was just unbelievable. It was just it, 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 incredible. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't believe the, the incidents there. It was just so over the top in terms of the uh, the, the kind of incidents it was relating that it was just uh, you, uh, no reader could suspend disbelief. But hey, that's just my my take on it. Maybe maybe other people will like it. Who knows? What what if uh, we were to read that a story like that under the pretense of surrealism? Would it then be justified that basically anything goes in surrealism, or am I reading surrealism uh, wrong? Um, I suppose. I mean, you could, you could say that, but uh, you know, I I don't know. Uh, um, I just think I personally have, like to have stories that have a little firmer <laughs> grasp of, of reality. Uh, that's, that's that's just my take. Mm. Okay. And I understand that uh, there there has been some back and forth between you and the organizer of Necronoma Con, um, Niels Hobbs. Yes. And also S.J. Bagley, who was trying to play both sides to, to if I understood your one of your blogs about that correctly. Mm, Do you care yeah, to revisit that? This was the most unfortunate development um, because, you know, God knows I wanted to appear at Necronomicon. I mean, it's the Lovecraft Convention. I suppose I should be there, but... Uh, uh, I, I, my troubles emerged 
even after the second one of 2015, which on the whole was a successful convention, but had some troubling elements in it. And, and after that convention, I had all these discussions with Niels about, you know, how to avoid the mistakes that we had before. And um, I just, I thought we were in some sort of agreement that, that certain people who really had nothing to contribute uh, either to Lovecraft or to weird fiction in general, you know, had no place there. Uh, and, you know, the problem with Niels is that he, he writes these messages to me in such a way that it's hard for me to tell what he actually is agreeing to. Uh, so uh, I felt that we had an agreement. Apparently he felt we didn't have an agreement. And so at the last minute he invited this uh, uh, dubious individual named Scott Nicolay to appear. And he was exactly one of the people whom I felt should not be there because he really has nothing to contribute. He has nothing to say, of any consequence on anything. Uh, and yet there he was. And so this happened at such a last minute that I felt I had no option but simply to withdraw because, you know, that, what else could I do at that point? Um, you know, and then then people said, oh, you know, criticized me by saying, oh, well, you know, Niels Hobbs can do whatever he likes. But apparently I'm not allowed to do whatever I like uh, in response to that. Uh, well, I did do whatever I liked, and that is not, not to appear at the convention. I was there in Providence. And then showed up a, a little bit to support Darren Cussey, my publisher. But beyond that, I had no role there. I distinctly remember Scott Nicolay, Nicolay um, disavowing Lovecraft's entire body of work. Um, and I don't remember, I think it may have began with the whole dust up over the World Fantasy uh, Convention Award. But I distinctly remember him using the words disavow. Now... Maybe he didn't. Use, maybe he didn't use the word disavow, but he, it was strong enough that, that it gave the impression that you know he he was done uh, praising or ri uh, writing any homages to Lovecraft or any sort of thing that would um, benefit Lovecraft's legacy. So well, that's an odd thing for him to say because he was published by uh, his only book, uh, only full uh, full length book was published by Fedogan and Bremer which was a small press, is a small press, um, uh, designed to publish Lovecraftian writing. <laughs> I mean, they, they started out as a press uh, devoted to publishing the works of Donald Wandry, who was a pretty close colleague of Lovecraft, you know, co-founder of Arkham House. And in fact, it was meant as a, a kind of a, a successor to Arkham House, which certainly was the predominant Lovecraft press of its time. So uh, uh, it is pretty hard for somebody like Nicolay to disavow Lovecraft when his own publisher... Uh, is in that situation. And what of Jeff Vandermeer, whose wife was editor in chief of Weird Tales for a time, right? Yeah, I don't. I have not much to do with him, but uh, or or her for that matter. Mm -hmm. But I do recall Mr. Vandermeer uh, in the course of this uh, kerfuffle about the World Fantasy Award, saying, "Oh, well, the replacement of the award is a no-brainer." Well, that would seem to imply that anybody who didn't want the award to be replaced was some sort of idiot or scoundrel or whatever. And I pointed this out in a blog and he got all, you know, uh, hot and bothered and said, oh, I don't want everything to do with you again. I said, well, fine, you are free to do what you like. Um, I just felt that he was kind of oversimplifying the situation. It is an immensely complicated uh, uh, matter uh, and uh, the word no-brainer does not seem to define, define the uh, situation adequately. I, I understand that uh, they were particularly upset about the direction that the Mar Marvin K era of Weird Tales was going in, um, whereas they, I guess they, if I, I, I'm coming to all this very late, and I apologize if I'm coming off like a muckraker because I'm really not. I'm, I'm just fascinated in the whole uh, mechanics of this genre, but. <sighs> I understand that they wanted to get back to a place where maybe Weird Tales is about Weird Tales, not about pointing out racists that have that have long since been deceased. Is that a good thing? Yeah, way to I think, I, well, I, I actually, you know, I, I was a, a uh, reviewer for Weird Tales. I, a column, you know, I wrote a review column for Weird Tales for a good number of years uh, when Daryl Schweitzer was the editor. And I, and, and I actually did write some killer reviews there that got me into some hot water there, but that was all uh, just <clears throat> entertainment. But um, uh, I frankly don't know that Weird Tales 
has had a has a viable history, you know, uh, shot anymore because. I mean, you know, I think it's 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 day is gone, and and you know we might as well just you know give it a fitting burial and, and just look to other you know magazines to to, to carry the the torch. But uh, it's been floundering ever since Daryl Schweitzer, you know, ceased to be the editor. Do people still read magazines in the vein of Amazing Stories, Astounding Stories, uh, Weird Tales? Do people? Do you think there's an audience there still? Well, in the weird fiction field, there just there aren't that many magazines out there that, that really can you know you know uh, attract wide attention. I mean, uh, um, I, I, since I'm not a fiction writer, I don't go out there and I don't even know the markets very well anymore. But uh, I'll tell you what, Hippocampus Press thought of starting a, a an annual magazine of weird fiction, and you know I collected some interesting material, but the publisher said, you know. It, 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 the material we have just doesn't. It, I, he just didn't didn't think it could it, it, it could succeed, you know, financially. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of money up front that you have to pay out, and you know, to contributors, and you know, it's not not clear that you'll ever get it back. So uh, it's it's hard. I mean, you know, because you know, with websites and things, and you know, and self publishing. I mean, the, the stuff is all out there, and it's it's uh, you know, keeping a magazine going is a very very, very difficult thing to do. Um, I am lucky in that Hippocampus Press uh, allows me to edit a magazine of weird poetry called Spectral Realms, and that's doing actually pretty well, even though, again, uh, our, our, our sales haven't been all that robust, but the poets love it. I mean, there's a lot of great weird poetry out there, and, uh, and apparently the publisher is willing to publish it even at a slight loss just to keep it going. So, uh, um, but, but running a magazine is a very difficult thing to do. I've seen several presses close recently, um, saying that it's it's time to move on because they're, we're in the middle of a uh, marketing downturn. Would you agree that uh, there is no literary, literary success to be had in the middle of a market downturn? Is there a marketing downturn right now? Mm, if we're talking specifically in weird fiction, I actually don't think so. I think, I mean, uh, believe me, there's a lot of good weird fiction out there and a lot of good writers. It's just, you know, trying to find them and sort through them and, you know, figure out who's who's good and who's not so good. Um, I think, uh, you know, people have been saying, especially that the, that the future of print publishing is, is, is you know, is, is doomed. And uh, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, uh, uh, the number of people reading, you know, e-books is actually either plateaued or actually is maybe even going down and print is actually still holding its own. Uh, Hippocampus Press does mainly print books. I mean, we do e-books uh, at a later stage. We don't do them immediately, I don't believe, anyway. Uh, we do both hardcovers and paperbacks. And, you know, I'm not saying that uh, the publisher's uh, raking in a fortune, but we, we get, get do well enough to get by. And, you know, uh, I work with other publishers like Centipede Press and PS Publishing in, in England and Dark Regions Press. They all seem to be, you know, doing well enough to, to keep going. PS Publishing is the one that's releasing an anthology next year that includes Axolotl House by Cody Goodfellow, correct? Yes, that's an anthology called Apostles of the Weird. And Cody Goodfellow is an incredible author, uh, a real wordsmith. I mean... Oh, Cody is an outstanding writer. I mean, and talk about writing action scenes. He can write some incredible action scenes. I, I read a lot of good stuff of his that really keeps you at the edge of your chair. And yet, it is written with this incredible verb and panache. I mean, his his style... You, you read Cody just for his style, uh, if, if for nothing else. And yet, there's plenty of else uh, uh, good to read in, in his work also. So he is... He is outstanding. I imagine you're not much of a fan of subgenres such as splatterpunk. Um, just a shot in the dark there, right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, in my book, The Modern Weird Tale, I actually had a chapter on, on splatterpunk. Now, the funny thing is that uh, this, well, uh, the person that people point to as the founder of splatterpunk uh, is David J. Scow, although he rejects <laughs> that designation. Scow is an outstanding writer. I was delighted to get even a short little story of his for the first Black Wings uh, uh, anthology, but uh, he has written some incredible 
incredible work. And, and you know, sure, some of his stuff is kind of over the top and uh, not for the squeamish, but uh, his novel, The Shaft, is an outstanding piece of work, and I was delighted when I persuaded Centipede Press to reissue that book uh, a, a few years ago because that book was only published in the U.K., and never got much of an audience in the U.S. and at least uh, now at least it has a has a, a U.S. imprint. Uh, but aside from that, I, I don't think Splatterpunk amounts to much. And I, I'm not even sure people are really writing Splatterpunk anymore. Now I guess they call it extreme horror nowadays. Uh, well, whatever. But uh, again, it, you know, the problem with that kind of writing is that it gets boring. You know. If you do stuff so over the top that it's just you know uh, it, it, the reader gets bludgeoned with all this with this uh, you know blood and guts and it's it loses its effect you know it doesn't it doesn't carry a punch anymore so uh, there I, I are no body parts left in the human anatomy that have not been uh, thoroughly bludgeoned um, violated or <laughs> um, rotisserie. Right. It, it, it gets, it gets tiresome. Yeah. I mean, that's why the, the subtle approach, the, 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 the what they call the quiet horror approach, is almost always superior to the over-the-top approach. Mm. Huh. Well, I, I, think, I think I'm think i finished with my muckraking here um, as far as uh, the detractors of Joshi and Lovecraft. Unless I've missed someone. Is there no, someone? I don't think so. I mean, as I say, I mean, a lot of this is just, you know... <laughs> internet back and forth. I mean, one of the main reasons why I don't, I am literally not on social media at all is because, A, I don't have the time for it, and I, I'm amazed that people do have the time for it. They must not have anything else to do with their lives, but, uh, but mostly because I really don't want to get involved in this kind of back and forth. Uh, you know, it's just too silly. I mean, we have better things to do with our time, don't you think? Um, you know, it's just... Uh, I mean, uh, there are certain things that I can't avoid commenting on because, the, you know, they, are, they get quite personal at times and, and, and reflect on me as an individual, and I don't like that. Um, but, uh, and, as, and, and, you know, to be honest, sometimes I just like to have a little fun of my own. I like to bait people and, and <laughs> start, you know, to start them getting all hot under the collar because it's, quite frankly, so easy to bait them. Uh, they, they, they respond very quickly to at least little uh, uh, nudge on my part. Uh, all quite amusing, but um, even that gets, gets silly after a while. Well, I mean, just the the, the ju just comparing you to Saruman um, and a friend of yours to Wormtongue uh, from the Lord of the Rings trilogy is is, uh, is is a bit over the top, and and maybe it's in jest and satire, just like uh, just like some of your jabs. But sure, sure, why not? Actually, I, I, it's been so long since I read the Lord of the Rings, and I'm not even sure who, who those people are anymore. Quite frankly. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the Lord of the Rings. I just feel that the whole trilogy is just a bunch of people marching, slogging through uh, uh, forests here and there. But um, <clears throat> so I, I, I don't know that I find that a great contribution to literature either. But maybe that's just my prejudice. Um, but hey, if they want to have fun on my account, well, let them. But <clears throat> beware, every now and then I will hit back. I think that a lot of people misread your character as. Uh, something of uh, uh, a deliberate antagonist at all times that you try to um, injure people, you know, emotionally and, and and disarm them. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think it, well, it, it stems from professional you, disagreement, right? If you read my article on Mr. Keene, I don't say one thing about him as a person because I don't know him as a person. I'm not even sure. I don't think I've met him. Uh, may have seen him at conventions every now and then, but I know nothing about him as a person and don't care about him as a person. My article is entirely about him as a writer. Um, and there you are. But other people seem to be perfectly happy making uh, assumptions about my character. Well, every now and then I need to correct those impressions. Absolutely. I think that a lot, it, it, it most overwhelmingly uh, stems from professional disagreements. And maybe they can't roll with the punches like you do. Hmm? Oh, that's quite obvious. They are highly sensitive and, and uh, uh, you know... Uh, that's why it's so easy to, to poke them. Uh, I mean, uh, perhaps I shouldn't give in to that kind of uh, baiting, but every now and then I just can't resist. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, 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 it provides some transit amusement for me, but um, uh, believe me, I, I, I have a lot better things to do with my time than that. Why don't we go through some authors who maybe 
do have a bright future in weird fiction, who have continued to fine tune their craft and and are on the up and up. Like you're you've always been very complimentary of Gemma Files, and I pro apologize yes. if I mispronounce that. I think it's Gemma. I'm Gemma. not sure, but I think it's Gemma Files. But, okay. Um, yes, outstanding writer. Oh man, uh, I remember. Um, when I was assembling this anthology called uh, A Mountain Walk, you know, Great great Tales of the Clula Mythos for Centipede Press, uh, I don't know how it was, but uh, somehow she said, you know, I have this 15,000 word uh, kind of Lovecraftian novel, a novella uh, called Anasazi, and, uh, you know, she had no home for it because, I mean, how, where do you sell a 15,000 word novella unless you, you know, do a separate publication or something? And I said, oh, go on, send, send it in. Let me, let me take a look at it. And man, oh, man, it was a tremendous piece of work. And, and because uh, the publisher, Jared Walters of Centipede Press, allowed me to have a lot of room in this anthology for, for long pieces of this guy, and I said, yeah, I, I would love to publish it. She was just overjoyed. Uh, and now I try to make a point of including her in any of the anthologies I've written or uh, compiled because she is a top, top flight writer. Also, you mentioned earlier Caitlin Kiernan. Caitlin Kiernan is a tremendous writer, uh, not just of Lovecraftian fiction. I mean, she's done a good bit of that, and Centipede Press is, in fact, going to come out with an anthology or a collection of her Lovecraftian writings, I think, just called Mythos Tales, I think. Um, anyway, I'm not sure what the title is, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, she is, uh, you know, the supreme pro stylist of our era, setting aside Ramsey Campbell, by the way. Ramsey Campbell is untouchable. I mean, he is, he is by far the greatest writer of weird fiction, Maybe of all time. I don't know. Um, the insects from Shagai, or sh is it Shagai? Shagai, yes. Yeah. Incredible well, story. Yes. Oh well, those early writings. I mean, that's that, that he wrote those as a teenager. But uh, uh, the stuff he wrote from in Demons by Daylight and so much else. I mean, uh, we could spend a whole podcast just about him because he is he is unassailably the greatest writer of weird fiction of our time and maybe of all time. Um, but but Caitlin Kiernan, I think, has some of the best prose of anybody writing today and it's just it's just a pleasure to read her just just for her prose hmm. huh. what about um what about uh willem pugmire ah willem pugmire a friend of mine of course he lives right here in seattle uh, just about 30 minutes away from me and uh, always nice to uh, go visit him he's uh, kind of a gentle giant um uh, a big bear of a man um his prose is quite amazing too. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he write he, he you know is a self-described uh, Lovecraftian writer. In fact, calls himself a Lovecraft fanboy, um, but he's a lot more than that. Um, and he he has evolved an incredible prose poetic idiom that just is such a such a pleasure to read. Uh, I mean, almost everything he writes is kind of prose poetry. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's sometimes not so strong on on a plot, but that's okay. Um, uh, he's he's done some amazing work, and he's going to have a big a big collection from Centipede Press too, uh, for which I wrote the introduction. Um, what about uh, Nicole Cushing? Have you are you familiar with her work at all? Because oh, well, only to the extent I, I wrote the introduction to her first collection. What is it called? The Mirrors uh, from from Cicatrix Press. Uh, outstanding piece of work. Um, you know, sometimes a little up and down, but, uh, um, you know, all short story writers uh, don't always ring the bell, but uh, uh, I haven't read much beyond that. I understand she's working on a novel, and I think she has a novella out there also. She is she is a very, very talented writer indeed. I would recommend I Am the New God. That, that was where, I believe that was her first book since her flirtation with Bizarro early on, if I'm not mistaken, and... Uh, that one really blew me away. Hmm. I know she's written two or three since then, but the publisher of I Am the New God has since closed, and I don't remember if it's Dark Currents or Dark Wire Press. Hmm. D d does that ring a bell at all? Not really. Well, there was a Dark... She didn't get published by Dark Renaissance books, did she? No, it was Dark Fuse. Dark Fuse. Dark Fuse. Oh, that's... I think... Isn't that Larry Roberts? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, that's unfortunate if that's if that's the case. Well, let's hope somebody can re reissue that book. There, there are a lot of presses um, that are closing their doors, and you say that you don't believe that that a market down that there's a, a market downturn in effect. It, maybe things get uh, harder at this time, but 
for writers and publishers, but that, that there are ways to weather the storm. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I don't really. I mean, I, it's hard for me to say. I mean, uh, in terms of what, what, where I where I think the market is going, but uh, I, I, I generally speaking, I work with presses that have established themselves sufficiently that I think they'll, you know, uh, keep on going for a while. There are a lot of tiny little presses in this field that maybe publish a couple books and then disappear, and that's just because, you know, you got to keep it up. You got to and you got to have a have a have a smart plan to 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 you know get get your books out there and, and uh, you know, uh, this field may not be big enough to have so many small presses, so that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that Journal Stone is a good market for uh, writers of weird fiction? Mm, I don't really know much about them, but uh, so I, I can't comment. Oh, fair enough. Who, who are some other authors that, that I have not mentioned that you feel are are sufficient for for advancing the genre well okay um i have to mention two canadian writers uh whom i i know and and admire greatly richard gavin and simon strancis uh they have both done outstanding work in the field and i hope they do more in fact, although i hear mr strancis seems to be uh, shifting toward only editing books instead of of, of writing, and I, I hope he reconsiders that because he is certainly, I think, one of the one of the finer writers in our field, and I intend to cover him uh, in a chapter of 21st Century Horror, and I've already written a chapter on Richard Gavin. Uh, I have to speak up for two of my, uh, I, I hope I can call them my my protégés or dis disciples or something. Uh, they're people that I helped to get published, and I, I think they have done outstanding work. Michael Aronovitz. Uh, lives in Pennsylvania, has written some great, great work, both in the short story and in the novel. He had a novel uh, published by um, uh, uh, Nightshade called Phantom Effect, and it's a tremendous piece of work. Uh, Jonathan Thomas publishes almost exclusively with Hippocampus Press. Uh, he's written five collections of short stories, uh, a lot of good Lovecraftian stuff in there as well. Uh, he's, he's done some great work. Um, and he's written a great novel called The Color Over Occam, which is a Lovecraftian novel that I think is, is fine. We can't overlook John Langan. Um, he is, I think he is certainly one of the premier writers of our field. Uh, I very much liked his novel, The House of Windows. Uh, this new novel he wrote called The Fisherman, good piece of work, but I didn't think it was quite up to the standard of House of Windows, but still, still a fine piece of work. Uh, and he does good work in the short story as well. My, my pen is scribbling furiously now. Color over Occam, House of Windows, Phantom Effect. Got it. Yes, indeed. Uh, what about Michael Wee Hunt? Yay, nay. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know him or don't, don't know of his work. So Greener Pastures come. Collection. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just. I, uh, how do you spell his name? W E H U N T. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry to say I have not met him, but I will, I will make a point of doing so. And you also mentioned The Shaft by David Scow. David Scow. Yes, as he is. The, oh, no. the now, that, that's, that's, uh, that was first published all the way back in 1990, uh, but Centipede Press reissued it a couple of years ago. And he is the progenitor of Splatterpunk, you said. Well, some of the Splatterpunk writers think or look, look to him as such. He apparently disavows that uh, label. Interesting. I had always heard it was John Skip and Craig Spector, but... They came a little later. Um, uh, uh, you know, this guy, Paul Salmon, and, and compiled an anthology called Splatterpunk back around 1991, uh, and, and he, uh, in that book, I think he, he claimed both, either that Clive Barker or uh, Scow were the uh, uh, progenitors of Splatterpunk, but apparently both of them say, no, I'm not. Thomas Ligotti. Uh, would you say he is an, an exceptional talent like Laird Barron, who did oh, no, not yes. listen oh, to oh, his... He is. He is. Okay. In, in my book, The Modern Weird Tale, which came out in 2001, I covered basically post-World War II horror, and, you know, starting with people like Shirley Jackson, Robert Aikman, going up to, you know, into the 80s and 90s. The three writers of the, of the 70s, 80s, 90s who... Are, are in a class by themselves, Ramsey Campbell, T.E.D. Klein, and Thomas Ligotti. Now, unfortunately, Ligotti has, has had some health difficulties, which we don't want to go into, uh, that basically prevented him from writing, uh, you know, very much after about the year 2000. Uh, the last major book he came out with was, was 
called uh, My Work Is Not Yet Done in 2002, which had some outstanding material in it. But then uh, that his health, health uh, problems came up, and he, he's published very little since then. Uh, lately, he did publish two short stories. I frankly didn't think they were all that good, but anything of his is better than 90% of stuff by anybody else. Uh, and I just hope he can resume his productivity someday. He is someone who has perhaps not uh, listened to his cheerleaders in the same way that you, you say Baron has, correct? That's correct. I mean, you know, a lot of people have praised him and justifiably praised him. But, uh, you know, he says, uh, well, I don't know, I, I know him slightly, so I, I don't want to put words in his mouth. But I think he, uh, you know, he is devoted to his craft and it's always wants to get better. And, you know, health permitting, I, I hope, you know, he can do, do good, better work in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, did did, did uh, we miss anybody else you might have wanted to bring up? Oh, just... So many others. I'm looking at my list here of the people I tend to cover in in my book. Um, Reggie Oliver, a British writer, does very good work. I've not read a whole lot of him, but I think he's someone that uh, needs to be paid attention to. Uh, a younger writer named Jason Brock, who's quite uh, quite out there on social media, and he tends to be somewhat of a provocateur. I think and he he tends to rile people up sometimes, but uh, uh, whenever he's not doing that, he's actually writing some very good fiction. And Hippocampus has published two outstanding collections of his short stories, and now he's working on longer works as well. So he's uh, he's definitely somebody worth watching. So you would recommend basically anything from Hippocampus Press or Centipede Press or PS Publishing, right? Well, yes. I mean, it's not only because I, I'm involved with those presses, but like, I, I, I'm involved with them because I think they do good work. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is know, rare. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, not, I mean, let's be honest. Not not everything that all these publishers do is is you know absolutely top of the line, but they certainly have a higher proportion of of good work than than other people do. And Dark Regions Press too, from uh, uh, which is uh, Chris Morey's uh, outfit. They do some very very good work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are are you? Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with William Hope Hodgson. Oh God, yes. House on the Borderland is probably the finest weird tale I have ever read, and I've forgotten so many from where I've been out of the loop the last few years. But House on the Borderland always stuck with me just for the... I mean, you you had the, the book as an artifact at the beginning, which is in the sense that these, these two fishermen discover this old uh, moldy uh, rain-drenched journal, and it tells the tale of this guy who lived with his sister in this estate, in this manor, with subterranean tunnels underneath with these pig people. I mean, why am I telling you? I'm sure you're more familiar with it than me. But, uh, and, and the things that he does at the conclusion of that tale that have to do with time and the manipulation of time is, is just incredible. Uh, I think the sun is supernovas. Not, I mean... I'm not really spoiling anything. Anybody can read these, and they probably already have, but I, I think the sun's supernovas, and uh, he ages, the whole world ages in seconds, but it's actually lifetimes, millennia, in a few seconds, right? Oh, it's a tremendous piece of work. I mean, the, the intensity of that book, I mean, you know, it's very hard, and Thomas Ligotti is going on, on this subject too, very hard to maintain the emotion of fear in a novel. I mean, it just is. I mean, because fear is such an intense emotion that it's hard to keep it up, you know, for long periods of time. It's very emotionally draining uh, to do that. That's why horror, generally speaking, works better in the short story or maybe the novella uh, form. But here's here's a and and House on the Borderland is not a long novel. It's you know it's a fairly short novel, but nevertheless. He keeps up that intensity of fear from beginning to end in a, in a way that, you know, maybe Lovecraft matches that in At the Mountains of Madness, but I can't think of very many other examples of that. Right. And The Willows, um, I don't remember if the the menace ever actually, uh, if they ever actually come face to face with it in the in the uh, body of the story. I think their bodies are found later or they disappear altogether. But you don't have to actually have a description of the thing or force of nature that is stalking those two um, men in the willows by Algernon Blackwood because it, it, it's 
the atmosphere of the story. I mean, the the force of this force of evil evil is felt throughout the story in such a way that it's its own character, right? Yeah, you know, the you know Lovecraft, the Willows, was the greatest weird tale ever written, and I think he might be right. Um, and yet Blackwood wrote a lot of other good stuff that was, you know, almost as good. Uh, there's a great collection called Incredible Adventures that has four or five novellas like The Willows. I think they're all, again, so intense. I mean, they just suck you in and, you know, uh, just by, by, you know, I don't know how, because Blackwood wasn't the greatest prose stylist in the world. He was not exactly a, a prose poet. Uh, his style is sometimes a little mundane, but uh, uh, he understood what I've called the psychology of fear about as well as anybody since Poe. And, and uh, he has the ability to just draw you in and, and keep you sort of hypnotized as to, uh, you know, in, in the course of a novella. Where do you see, where do you see uh, weird fiction being in 20 years? And what do you feel your legacy will be? Aside from Lovecraft. I mean, you. Well, I, I, I... Uh, there's no way to predict what what weird fiction is going to going to do in in uh, you know whatever. But uh, uh, I have genuinely believed that we are in a kind of silver age of weird fiction. The golden age of weird fiction, let's be honest, was end of the 19th century into the 20th century with people like Mackin, Nassani, Blackwood, Lovecraft, M. R. James, uh, Walter Delamere, uh, L. P. Hartley. I mean, there were so many really really fine writers. Since World War II, we've had some outstanding people. I mentioned Shirley Jackson, Robert Aikman, Ramsey Campbell, Ted Klein, uh, Ligotti, and I think we can add Caitlin Kiernan and a few others to this list. Um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, those writers, and or at least some of them, uh, are going to continue to do good work and, uh, you know, uh, just take it from there. In terms of me, I hope that... Um, I do hope that people see me as something more than just a Lovecraft guy. Uh, I mean, I've written the entire history of weird fiction uh, and, and now writing a, a little follow-up to that. And I've, I've edited a lot of other writers of weird fiction, you know, both past and, and present. Um, and so I, what I've tried to do throughout my career is to establish uh, weird fiction as a legitimate form of literature. Because when I first started, you know, and I started as a teenager, you know, in the 1970s, it was quite obvious to me that the standard, you know, literary uh, culture felt that horror fiction, supernatural fiction was kind of a, kind of a, uh, you know, a poor relation to literature. It was even sub-literary. And it frankly didn't help that, that schlock writers like, you know, uh, a lot of those writers from the 1970s, uh, you know, who just churn this stuff out in, in the wake of people like King and Strau and Barker, uh, you know, kind of kind of devaluated the field and, and uh, you know, made it seem as if it was all just schlock horror. Um, so I have always sought to, you know, show where the where literature uh, or where weird fiction, you know, really can be considered genuine literature and, and to promote those authors. Uh, you know, who are, who are along that, those lines, and I hope that's what my legacy will be. Okay. You you have taken a hit uh, in terms of criticism because apparently you were not academic enough for some stodgy elitist um, writers, and, uh, you know, we're, like I said, we're done with the muckraking, but I just want to uh, point out that all the authors who formed this great literature that we've spoken about, they didn't necessarily all come from um, decorated academic backgrounds. Uh, I'm sure some of them didn't even attend any sort of academy or, or university. So that's really moot. I mean, you can be a self-taught author. I mean, you can come from much humbler beginnings and, and still be immensely gifted. Well, let's not forget that uh, Mr. Lovecraft did not finish high school. You know, it's incredible. Uh, he was one of the greatest self-taught people I've ever encountered. Uh, I like to think that I am self-taught. I've, I've learned way more since I dropped out of Princeton Graduate School than I than I'd learned before that. Um, but, uh, and frankly, let's be honest, a lot of the great critics in our field are also are not academicians as such. Um, actually, the, the, the problem is we don't have enough good critics in this field um, you know, but, uh, 
and 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 I've been trying to foster you know better criticism of weird fiction in addition to to my other things. But uh, uh, I don't know. It's um, I have never been an academic writer because I've never been associated with with, with the university. That's 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 the definition of an academic writer. Um, I am a scholarly writer at times because my work, I believe, is of a scholarly nature. Uh, you know, every now and then, and uh, I've published a number of work uh, with academic publishers, more than most academicians do, as a matter of fact. Uh, but, you know, I have always set out to write criticism that is accessible to the average intelligent person. I do not want to restrict my writing just to uh, other academicians or, or to some sort of highbrow, uh, you know, literary set. Uh, it has to be accessible, uh, you know, to, to people if it's going to have any impact. Um, otherwise, you're just writing for a handful of people that you know and never gets out anywhere. Well, as far as the subject of criticism um, being being lacking, from judging from my experience in in various uh, local writers groups and networking with authors and meeting them in person uh, on on not just a fan level, I might add. Um, I, I I don't I think that. That there isn't a thick enough skin out there for most authors to invite criticism in the way that might help them better themselves stylistically, uh, linguistically. Now, how, what what do we do about that? Because I, I think that you you mentioned earlier schmoozing, and I think that there's way too much of that going on. Well, yeah, I don't know how you counteract that, uh, but the problem is there simply aren't even any venues for the publishing of of criticism or even reviews sometimes i mean uh, i you know i've lived long enough I'm, I'm almost 60 now i've lived long enough to see how you know little by little by little uh you know you know review magazines or, or places where reviews get published just those are falling by the wayside the only reviews you see nowadays are, are online reviews which tend not to be terribly rigorous for the most part, especially things like reader reviews from Amazon, which a lot of them are probably just engendered by the author's you know, friends and things like that. Um, it's basically, they're just publicity outlets. Um, I mean, you know, I, was in, I have been involved with two different review magazines, uh, Necrophile back in the 1990s from Necronomicon Press, and we just published reviews. Uh, that's all we did. Uh, and apparently that was fairly successful, but uh, and now uh, uh, I was involved with uh, Dead Reckonings for a while from Hippocampus Press, um, still going under somebody else's editorship. But uh, you know, it's it's um, it, it, our, that the readership of that magazine isn't very robust, and we just I think that's probably published at a loss. Um, but you know, there are not a lot of other venues where you know insightful lengthy you know detailed reviews can appear uh, or or even criticism i mean i run a, a journal called weird fiction review annually from centipede press and i you know i have a certain number of articles in there every year but uh, that's just one magazine and you know coming out once a year that's not nearly enough to, to sustain a whole you know field of criticism so it's tough i, I don't know what to do do you, do you feel a kinship with Lovecraft as, as much time as you have you've spent, you've labored over uh, just following in his footsteps, you know, tracing his work, uh, his background, where he lived and everything? I mean, do you do you feel like you, you know him as, as if he were a friend? I oh, can tell you care. Sure. I mean, I, you know, my major task over the last five, six, seven years has been to edit all his remaining letters, and, and you know, we're, we're going to be coming out with any number of editions of letters over the next couple of years, and those are so, so revealing. I mean, uh, uh, the kind of person he was, and you know, I'll tell you, they're they're, they're just amazing documents. Uh, but the thing is, I try to follow in Lovecraft's footsteps in the sense of, I mean, he he was incredibly generous, not with money because he didn't have much money, but generous with his time, with his expertise, with his advice to fellow writers, and I think that's why he became such a beloved individual and people like, you know, to people like Robert Block and Fritz Leiber and Derleth and Wandra and all these people who, who sought out his advice and, and got really good advice for him on in the craft of writing. I try to do something similar uh, when, you know, I'm, I'm open to, to, to novice writers who want me to read, you know, work of theirs. And I try to criticize it honestly and say, okay, this is good. This part, maybe not so good. And here's how you can get better. Uh, because I feel that that kind of personal contact is just the 
really about the only way that, you know, uh, how else are you going to get get any better? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, you just, you just, you know, I, I feel that that's an important thing for me to do. And I, I'm lucky enough to have attracted, you know, some writers, as I mentioned before, like Michael Ronovitz and Jonathan Thomas, who have gone on, you know, through my help or to, to become really good writers and who don't need my help anymore now. Um, and I hope to continue that work in the future. Yeah, I have an extensive reading list here, thanks to uh, all those you mentioned. <laughs> um, before we wrap this up, I understand that you do have a novel or novella coming out uh, this year or next, probably next now? Yeah, next fall, I believe, PS Publishing will come out with a novella of mine called Something From Below. Uh, I, I don't really like that title, but I couldn't think of a better one. It's, it's actually uh, an adaptation of uh, a story by Donald, or the title is an adaptation of a story by Donald Wandry that he, that he calls something from above. Um, it, believe it or not, it's a story set in the coal mining country of nor like northeast Pennsylvania, of all places. Uh, I, I don't know how I was inspired to write that. I don't write a lot of fiction. I've, I've written a story you know, every now and then. I don't, I don't think I'm a particularly good fiction writer. Nobody's going to remember me for my fiction. But this work seemed to come together better than other things of mine. Uh, and I, you know, it turned out to be about 37,000 words. And I think that was just the right length for it. I, I really didn't want to try to artificially extend it to full novel length. I mean, I suppose I could have, but it, it seemed right just the way it is. And I, I actually think it came out pretty well. Uh, and, and Mr. Willem Pugmire was kind enough to think think highly of it. So that's, that's something. But... Uh, We'll see what we'll see what people say. Um, yeah, PS Publishing will come out with it in the fall of 2018, uh, which follows, by the way, the publication of my memoirs called "What Is Anything" that Hippocampus will publish in the summer of 2018 when I turn 60, uh, and that'll be, I hope, a fairly lively piece of writing. Excellent. It, it's it's so inspiring to see that you've kept up such a um, vigorous schedule and. Uh, I want to thank you for keeping Lovecraft's memory um, not sainted, because he doesn't deserve that, but you have done your very best to preserve the memory of what he accomplished and what he did for other authors um, in, in, I mean, just just the notori notoriety of his work um, has en enshrined other authors. And maybe my wording's poor on that, but I thank you for giving me your time as well. And do you have any closing thoughts before we uh, conclude? Mm, not covered a big gambit here, and I'm you know I'm grateful to you for allowing me this this forum because uh, you know I mean it's, maybe I've not said anything that I've already not said uh, out there before, but uh, you know a lot of these things do bear repeating. And I you know believe me, I if you meet me in person, I'm actually a very nice guy. I like to think. Um, uh, I adopt a certain uh, barbed persona every now and then in some of my writing, but that's just for fun. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think I'm a nice guy. I hope my wife will agree to that. Um, uh, so uh, it's just, uh, you know, I, I'm just carrying on doing what I want to do in life. And doing a fine job of it. Thank you so much, Mr. Joshi. You're all fucking autistic. <laughs>